Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and today I've had the pleasure already of making the acquaintance of Travis Marsh, and I'm excited to talk to him about, well, as much as we can fit into about 15 minutes of conversation. You know this podcast is my hardest job to make sure I keep it brief, and I can already tell I'm going to want to ask Travis a bunch of follow-up questions. So bear with me as I introduce him to you, and then we, we do our best to keep it brief and impactful, which is always our aim here. Travis is the author of a book called Lead Together. He's a facilitator for MBA students at Stanford in a class, and I love this, affectionately called Touchy Feely. <laughs> You're in the right place, Travis. He's also founded Human First Works, which focuses on helping purpose-driven organizations that want to create more agility, resilience, and accountability by leveraging the talent they already have in place. Travis, thank you for sharing some time with me today. I'm excited to, I'm excited to dart my eyes at the zoom clock and realize that i've already let it go too long i'm excited i'm excited to travel down some tangent roads with you today <laughs> oh i can't wait i'm so excited to be here thanks for having me well let's let's go back to the beginning not the beginning beginning i like to sometimes joke let's not go back to i was born on a sunny day and whatever but you're beginning as a coach now a lot of times that that particular word as it's as it's definitely advanced in the in the vocabulary of people, a lot more people today understand what a coach is or what a coach can do than they did even just a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago. But how did you realize that you could make the kind of impact you wanted to have as a coach? How did you first discover that coaching was really a way for you to both kind of grow and add to your impact and influence in the world? By absolutely screwing it up as royally <laughs> as possible. So. Uh, I got promoted into a management position and like, I was like hard charging, like technical sales, wanted to go win capitalism, make as much money as I can, try and be the, the smartest person in as many rooms as I could be. And, and I was a real dick of a boss, just a slave driver. I'm like, okay, great. You all want the same thing I do, right? Like no concern about where they're coming from or what their perspective is. And it's like, you want to go make a bunch of money, go try and do this. And I will help you achieve that and completely missed the, the signals. I was, mm -hmm. I was inches away from firing the entire team and my boss in a wonderful, very coaching sort of moment. He's like, there is another common denominator here. And it is not that they are all stupid. Right. <laughs> that was <laughs> my, my come to Jesus moment. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I've been treating people as as uh, ends and not means, right? Like not thinking about where they were. And mm -hmm. it was like, like I worked through that and why that was coming up for me. I uh, got a coach of my own and started to unpack uh, some pieces of the other uh, puzzle and mm -hmm. said, okay, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to let them make the other uh, strategy that they want to, uh, to make, empower them. You know, I'll be helpful and I'll bring a lot of data, right? Which I was hmm. like, now looking back at it, I was still trying to control the situation. And mm -hmm. so I, I brought the data. It was really clear the best way to, uh, to change the, the course is like the top 30 customers were where all the revenue was. And so mm -hmm. they came and they're like, great, we've got a plan. We're going to go after everybody that's not the top 30. It was like clearly testing me, like, like, are you really going to let us have our way or not? And, <laughs> and they, they pulled it off, right? Like they, they hustled and, you know, eventually they figured out it was not the strongest strategy and that they changed it as soon as they could six months later. But the next strategy that they came up with was far better than anything I could have ever dreamed of. It was like leveraging partners. It, and that's really when I started to understand oh, you know what? Like, it doesn't matter how smart anybody is. The collective intelligence is going to be far greater than what any one person brings and letting mm -hmm. and making space for that to naturally arise, especially when things really matter is one, really challenging and two, even more useful than it is challenging. I love that. That, that brings to mind one of my very favorite, throughout most of my life, one of my very favorite sayings or at least a partial saying when talking about a, a team working working super duper well together and having great success and identifying their chemistry, their team chemistry as what's actually like sparking them to like new levels. That phrase greater than the sum of its parts or greater than the sum of their parts. I was I've always fascinated by the by the poetry of that phrase from a very young age, long before I had any understanding of it. And I'm still growing in my understanding of it today. But there's just something about that 
about a well-constructed, I don't want to say machine because that gives a sort of a, me a mechanical bent, but like almost like a formula, like an equation that when you've got mm -hmm. all the right elements in place and everything is balanced and you've got the right variables and you've got all the right elements in place, what you can add up to can be so much greater than you could even imagine or even hope for. And translating that understanding and awareness, put, translating that to the team environment, to the human environment, and putting that into action, like just like just like your team did, you also had to learn some hard lessons. You had to try some stuff and have that fail spectacularly, which I mean, no better teacher, quite frankly, if mm -hmm. you're willing, if you're if you're willing and able to shall we say, bounce back from that and learn those lessons. <laughs> but that's just it's beautiful how, that, how that happens. And it's it takes a while, sometimes longer for some than for others. I must admit to some some failures on my part there as well. But eventually you realize that that is the best way forward. It's just, there's just, there's no better way to accomplish what you want to accomplish and to get to where you want to go than to equip and empower your team, equip and empower your people, whoever you're working with and for, and move forward together, including maybe making some bad choices maybe having some poor strategic decisions here and there, because what you'll gain from that quote unquote failure will be so much greater than any short-term success you might have been able to white knuckle your way to. And like, I find it fascinating that so many of us have like two very opposite experiences, right? Like one, we've all been on teams that really are amazing. And two, most of the teams and groups that we're in, like, are mediocre at best, some truly suck. And yeah. so <laughs> how do we rectify the fact that like there's greatness that's here, but mostly there's like like this feeling like what, what's that uh, little meme that's going around right now? It's like, oh, when I when I die, I want everybody I worked on a group project with to, uh, to lower me into the ground so they can let me down one more time, right? <laughs> and like, how, how, do we, how do we balance those two dichotomies that show up? And that's a really hard question that I don't think many people have a strong answer to. Yeah. And not enough people are are answering the call. Like that's that's a question that requires it requires some attention, some skills, some talent, some time, some patience, because that's I mean, that question unlocks it unlocks so much. It unlocks real alignment when you actually have not just the metaphor of everyone in a boat rowing in the same direction, which is what we're shooting for, but you actually feel that it's like, oh wait, we are rowing in the same direction and every individual member's actions is contributing to the forward momentum of the entire boat. It's like, that's, it's a great metaphor. It's a great analogy, but it, it takes some real work. And I love that. I mean, uh, forgive me. This is the, I'm going to blow smoke up your butt portion of the podcast. It might happen again too, but I love when people like you dedicate themselves to, to that question. Cause it really, like you said, there's just not enough of an awareness of that question and a seeking of answers to that question of how to get how to get people rowing in the same direction, how to get alignment in both in your team and across teams, especially when you're operating in like a bigger organization where you've got, you know, where you wonder if the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, so to speak. Another one of my favorite phrases. It's like not mm -hmm. just knows what they're doing, but sometimes those hands have to work together to, you know, maybe row the boat or swing the bat or, you know, cook the meal or whatever analogy you want to throw out there. And yeah, I just, I, we need more attention on that question and on all of the answers and the implications of that answers. And so, yeah, it's speak on it, continue. <laughs> and, and I just, I just love the people like building on the, the ones that dedicate themselves. Right. Like, like I like the, the research of like Dr. Ruth Wagman and Richard Hackman who did the 16 conditions, right. Yeah. Where they figured out what makes a team. And it's like, like, Oh, do we know who's on the other team? Do we have a compelling purpose? Do we actually have the right people that can get this done? Do we have the right structure in context to do these things. And then other ones like new work that I don't think nearly enough people know is Vanessa Dreskett's work on team emotional intelligence, where she found like the, the three big buckets, like the fundamentals, the social capital, and the emotional intelligence norms that help like truly great teams move from that good to great. So I'll plant that little seed because I, I know your uh, your podcast listeners are avid learners. So some things <laughs> for them to go uh, check out along the way. I love that. N familiar names and names I had not heard before. I'm like, interesting. And the way you yeah, the way you set that up, I have some I have some Googling to do on my on my on my lunch break later today. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's let's bring things as, as much as I could stay in the conceptual realm with you, I could tell for for a very long time. Let's 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 bring things to the present and let's get down boots on the ground. Let's talk about human first works. Let's talk about your work there. And 
I'll ask this as a personal question and you can answer it however you'd like. Um, who, <laughs> I, always, I always feel like I'm interrogating my, my guests when I ask this question, because it sounds like, you know, I've got you in a room and I'm like, who do you coach and how do you coach them? But <laughs> really like who you focus on, who you focus your work on and how you coach them being what your methodologies are and what your frameworks might be, whether you're one-to-one -one or group coaching, masterminds, coursework, books, you know, obviously some, in some cases, in many cases, all of the above, but yeah. Who do you coach and how do you coach them in your work, both individually and through human first works? So our fundamental belief is that, and the reason I was talking so much about teams is that teams are the building block for the 21st century. Right. You could you used to be able to build an organization on a high performing person and you bring them all the decisions. Right. And you you build a pyramid structure toward towards that. Right. Nowadays, if you build pyramids, you end up getting mummies. Right. And everybody except that top person is the other one that uh, is making all the other critical decisions. So we believe if you switch that, especially starting with the executive team. So we work with executive teams of. 20 to 200 person organizations. Normally, uh, the, there's some leader on there, uh, often the CEO, but occasionally it's actually somebody uh, for the next rung down from the C-suite on like, like the CT, CTO or CMO or somebody like that, that's trying to make change in the organization can see some possibility and, hmm. and creating not just change for them, but also change on the, the team that they're on. And now we're also kind of kicking off, like you mentioned, a mastermind group for CEOs that are actually out there on the, the more bleeding edge on they've already gone through the work in transforming their organizations towards something that's more self-managed distributed authority. And they've already done that for a couple of years and they want to connect with other CEOs that are out there on the bleeding edge. So those are kind of the two fundamental groups that we like to, uh, to work with most. I like that. I like that. That, that. that exemplifies a certain, in my opinion, necessary commitment to you don't just get to figure out it's like, oh, I identified the changes I needed to make in the organization and then we executed those and now I'm done. It's it's sort of a, actually very much an ongoing process. Whether you're on the bleeding edge or like smack dab in the middle, there's a commitment to change and growth that really is required if you want, if you want to see the kind of impact you you want to see out of your business, out of your organization. And it's man, it is so tempting. I don't want to say to rest on your laurels because that makes it seem like you're proud of yourself, but just to like to go through a major change and even to have great success in that change and then just to relax, which and I'm not to say that you, you can't relax sometimes take your take your breaks where you can. But there's just there's something about that commitment to change, that commitment to ongoing change and evolution that I feel like separates it separates the real leaders from the ones who are, shall we say, still in development. Or still in early stage development, I should say. <laughs> yeah, there's always this weird tension between, hmm. okay, I can be proud of all the things I've done. And I also, when I'm in that quiet place where, where I can look at things, I know I'm probably holding the organization back because of something I haven't learned. And so how do I have both of those at the, at the same time and, and be honest with myself instead of just one or the other is really hard it's useful to have somebody outside yourself to be that mirror and that reflection that's it that's it right there that's that's one of the things that first drew me to coaching in general just as something to look into and the thing that gets the reason why i'm so passionate the reason why i hand talk and i find that my podcast episodes go long because i get to talking about it and i just find their to be such a value in a coach i've referred to i've referred to <laughs> Maybe not inappropriately, but a little bit tongue and cheekily referred to coaches as sort of like the intimate stranger, because there's mm -hmm. this degree of commitment and investment from a coach in their in their clients that is really like a close, trusted friend or a confidant. And yet they have that distance of a stranger where it's just like, hey, I'm I'm invested in you, but I don't have any baggage with you. We haven't been friends since college. And I know about the thing you did that one night and yada, yada, yada. There's none of that, none of that extra stuff that comes with some of those deeper intimate relationships that are so valuable. And there's also with that, the skill and experience of being in that position to where it's like, I know the questions to ask you, even though I'm just now getting to know you, I know what to ask to start the conversation going in the right direction. And I know what to get you to ask yourself. And I've got exercises and I've got techniques and tips and whole frameworks for you to start working on. And it's just, there's something so, to me, so powerful about these, I hate to use this word because it's so, it's so cheeky, but the synergy 
in that particular relationship that a coach can provide. It's just, there's really nothing quite like it. And I feel like for leadership development, it's just, if you're serious at all about it, you've got to coach. <laughs> every, every great leader, right? It used to be 20 years ago, it was kind of a, a hidden secret. But now mm -hmm. the other uh, cat's out of the other uh, bag. Everybody from Bill Gates uh, to Elon Musk is somebody that they rely on. And great, right? Like we all need uh, support and, and then sometimes challenge at the right moment and somebody to balance the two. Yeah, distance and proximity at the same time. It's like, I almost find it, it, it's easiest to almost speak to it in the in the language of paradox, which is funny because it makes so much sense. And again, a coach is both very, very close enough to see and act on everything that needs to be seen and acted on and far enough away to do it with clarity. And that's just, it seems like it's impossible, but it is precisely what a coach brings to the table. And I just, I can never get over how, how much sense a coach makes. <laughs> so here I am blowing smoke up your butt again being grateful that you and people like you are dedicated to that space. And in particular to, to leadership development, I just think it's, it's so necessary and so powerful. And I'm, I'm doing the thing where I'm wrapping up because I'm looking at the clock and I'm realizing that I've got like 17 follow-up questions for you, both like boots on the ground and conceptual. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a chance now <laughs> to talk a little bit more about, about where people can find out, not just more about you, but about human first works and where people can connect with you if they're looking to do that as well. Just like, you know, kind of start a conversation, maybe, you know, see about starting a, a professional relationship with you. So if people, this is my, another one of my interrogatory questions where I've got you in the room behind the chair. It's like, what did you know? And when did you know it? How can people just learn more about you? If they just want to learn more about your story, your journey, what you're, what you did then, what you're doing now, what you're doing going forward, et cetera, et cetera. And if it's different, where can people best connect with you if they wanted to start a conversation, a friendship, go out and have coffee with you, begin a professional relationship, anything in between? So yeah, where can people, if, if that's different, where can people find out more and connect with you? So if people want to know more about the backstory, I would totally recommend Ed Frauenheim's book, Reinventing Masculinity. My story ended up on there and is a, just a great book, highly recommended for men and women alike. For nice. connecting, chatting more, definitely LinkedIn is the place that I am most active. And it's, you know, the Travis Marsh, T-R-A-V-I-S-M-A-R-S-H as my handle on LinkedIn, or you can find me at humanfirstworks.com. Perfect. I'll make sure the links to everything's in the show notes. And if I can find a link to that book, I'll put that in there as well, just so that people have, have one click for their next step on their on their journey to Travis Marsh, <laughs> whatever that might look like. So thank you. And I know uh, for the third time, for the third and final time, I'll blow some smoke up your butt. Thank you so much for both sharing some time with me today and and for the focus of the work that you do. I just, I, I, I think it's in the name. Also human first works, I feel like is a very appropriate name for not just everything that you do, but all the values you represent. And I don't know, thanks for sharing a little bit of time today and thanks for doing what you do. I, I really appreciate it. And I'd love to have you back on. I feel like, like I said, I feel like we could go for a lengthy bit of time <laughs> on the high yeah. concept stuff, the medium concept stuff, the boots on the ground stuff, everything in between. I feel like we could definitely, there's, there's always more meat on this bone. So I'd love to have you back on. <laughs> this was super fun. Right back at you. Really appreciate the, uh, the work you do and how you do it. So thanks for, for being here, for doing all the organization piece of the puzzle. And uh, this was a lot of fun. I'd be happy to come back anytime. Awesome. Okay. And for the audience, if that's not enough of a tease for you, <laughs> we'll always be back on this podcast feed with you very soon with another coach. And also one of the things I know you've come to love is when we have coaches back on for a second or a third or a fourth. I don't want to make any promises on your behalf that you might not want to keep, but I love checking in, seeing how things are going. The audience loves it too. So thank you, Travis. Thank you, audience. Thank you for everything that all of you do. And we will talk to you again very soon. Thank you all.